Hello, Derek Cowell, uh, our History 101 or 17A class. Here we go, right? So Spanish colonization of the Americas in the early modern era. So what we want to do is we want to jump right to, um, uh, to the basics, right? So with the basics, right? The Black Legend. The Black Legend has to do with um, discourse or dialogue about morally evaluating Spanish colonization. Uh, the Spanish came in, right? And then um, it didn't take long for primarily English and Dutch Protestant writers uh, to vilify the Spanish, uh, to basically portray them as the anti-model of colonizers, of exactly what we don't want to promote, right, uh, in, in our contemporary values, so that they were uh, especially... Um, had open license to uh, indulge in their greed and brutality, uh, these Spanish conquerors, these conquistadores, um, that they were especially tyrannical and uh, formed a very hierarchical and um, inequitable society where just a, the few leading Spaniards at the top, life was good for them at the expense of most other people, right? And so the Spaniards, uh, that this is a whole other can of worms to, to talk on another subject, but of course they uh, the 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 word black with negativity uh, they're going to call this a, a black legend that they're they're being um, unfairly spuriously um, denigrated for political reasons by by her enemies. All right, so that's what we refer to as the black legend. The black legend was largely largely entered. Uh, discourse, right, where people were talking about it uh, through the writings of a Spaniard, actually, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, right? And so the legend states that um, uh, under Antonio de Montesinos, he was listening to um, his sermon, uh, preaching against uh, the, the, the brutal and exploitative treatment of Native Americans. And uh, at that time, Las Casas claims to have had somewhat of an epiphany, right? A life-changing event, religious event, whereby he relinquished his encomienda, and we'll talk about encomiendas briefly, um, and uh, engaged in, in uh, literary and political pursuit of defending the rights and, and bringing about eliciting uh, empathy for Native Americans so that it could materialize into policies that would defend them and help them, right? And so at any rate, his book, uh, Breve Relacion, right? A Brief Relation of the Things of the Indies, right? Because they called the Caribbean the, the Indies. Uh, at any rate, the um, it it's very, very polemical. Uh, you look at it like in the Spanish form, in the Spanish literary book, and he says right off the bat, right? Like these, these um, the Spaniards, right, vinieron uh, como tigres, like they came as tigers and as lions, seeking whom they could devour. And he calls the, the, the Native Americans across multiple tribes, uh, ovejas mansas, right, meek sheep. Uh, so he empathizes with the natives. He wants his readers to empathize with them. And then some of his accounts are just incredible, right? As, as far as them making bets, the Spaniards, that is, as to who uh, they could slit in half with one blow of their sword, uh, killing babies, hanging people in groups of 13 in honor of Christ and the 12 disciples, and letting their feet get one foot from touching the ground tantalizingly, uh, burning them alive. Just awful, awful stuff, right? Uh, he has the famous Cholula Massacre. And in there, right, he said that basically this is a loose translation from the Spanish, but that the Spaniards wanted to increase fear of them. They wanted fear of them, of the Spanish, uh, to uh, spread throughout all corners of the land, them especially being so outnumbered by the Native Americans. And one can make the argument that that fits in with many definitions for terrorism. So at any rate, you have Las Casas, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you had a guy named uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, and Castillo was a, a self-alleged right-hand man of Hernan Cortez and the conquistadores, right, who uh, took Mexico, who took um, uh, Tenochtitlan, the, the, the city of the Aztec Empire, 
And so at any rate, he he comes about from the other end of the spectrum, right? He says, I'm going to give the true history, right? La historia verdadera of what really happened. And of course, in this one, uh, he kind of turns the tables. It's a little simplistic to state that he simply does a 180 from Las Casas because he does um, he does concede uh, faults of the Spaniards, uh, their greed uh, pilfering into the um, the treasure that Moctezuma was keeping in a room nearby where they were hospitably being kept. Um, he talks about um, Cortez pretty early on uh, offering uh, riches to his men if they'll follow him so that he fairly early on developed a design uh, to enrich himself at the expense of the Aztec Empire. Uh, but for the most part, he depicts them as fallible human beings who just kept falling into one scenario after another that oftentimes tended to be at least partially beyond their control, the Spaniards' control, right? And that um, he depicts uh, Moctezuma, right, as a very charming, very um, well-spoken, uh, awesome-to-behold man, uh, but but at the same time, right, that he was he was capable of treachery and duplicity, uh, which he carried out with um, a guy named Pedro de Narvaez behind the back of um, of of uh, Hernan Cortez, supposedly according to Castillo. He contends that the the Aztec warriors taunted and whistled at the Spaniards and threatened them, claiming that they were going to kill them and eat them, etc. And so you get a very different take from this, right? Whereby the Christian God helps the Spaniards by the grace of God uh, fight against these adverse circumstances, etc. Even the Cholulan massacre, he he puts in a different context, saying that the um, the Cholulans were on the eve of attacking them, and that they preemptively got the Cholulans first, so that the Cholulans were not just innocent victims. So very much different take from Castillo. Uh, on his um, Historia Verdadera, all right? So uh, hopefully that's clear for all. So let's go ahead and move on for the sake of brevity. Uh, so then also, notice number 14, Spanish regional claims of future U.S. territory. So 1540, approximately there, uh, was a big year. The Spanish claimed with these, uh, they were called entradas, right? These entrances for uh, people that who could be... Uh, entitled by something called an adelantado. Uh, and an adelantado had a lot of power, was given a lot of power, privileges, connections, wealth, etc. Uh, for someone who made an entrance into pagan lands and claimed that land uh, for Castile, for Isabella, right, of Castile. So at any rate, um, let's see here. The Spanish claimed that through Coronado, Vasquez de Coronado. He was supposedly right looking for the seven cities of Cibola of gold, to which, of course, he never found. Um, uh, but because of his entrance and that route going in through the, uh, you see on the map on the top, uh, he claimed the land for Spain there, therein. Uh, the Spanish claimed Alta California from Cabrillo. Cabrillo may have been a Portuguese uh, hire for the Spanish. Uh, he sailed up the coast of Upper as opposed to Baja, right, California, and claimed that for Spain in around 1540 as well. And then also Hernando de Soto. Hernando de Soto, according to the primary sources, was not a very likable man. Uh, he kind of is used, men like himself are oftentimes used to support the black legend, that he used extortion and uh, violence to try to get, uh, to try to elicit fear uh, amidst being outnumbered by natives of the Southeast, Native Americans of the Southeast, and, and some big um, confederacies that were already intact when he came there, and also to get much needed supplies, etc. And that um, supposedly there was a, a degree of mutiny from his own men. But at any rate, through his case, right, he claimed the lower part of the Mississippi River and, and the states to the, to the east of it. And actually, if you look at the expedition uh, map, I apologize, I guess he, uh, well, no, he made it, yeah, I guess that according to that map, he made it west of the Mississippi, uh, which I did not remember, I apologize. Uh, so let's see here. And then Cabeza de Vaca wrote a very um, interesting, very dramatic autobiography of his, um, 
his naufragio, his um, his shipwreck incident when he was under an expedition with guys like uh, Ponce de Leon uh, who were granted Florida. Uh, but of course they met military stiff resistance and it all fell to pieces. And he went through uh, esclavitude. He went through like servitude as like a slave to Native Americans. Uh, he traveled around as a, as a medicine man independently. Uh, uh, very, very dramatic story. But at any rate, through his his adventures, so to speak, right? Uh, Spain will claim the, much of the states, the future states of the Los Estados Unidos of the U.S. in the South, right? So uh, through Texas, etc. So at any rate, then in 1565, uh, to this day, the longest lasting Euro-American city or town is St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, the Spaniards under Menendez de Avila came in there against particularly the French Huguenot Protestants. And uh, they wiped them out in a couple places and tried to secure a beachhead. And recall that the, the French had established um, legal claims to the Mississippi Valley on both sides of the Mississippi River up and down it as early as 1535 uh, via uh, Jacques Cartier's, uh, quote, discovery. I say, quote, of course, because the Native Americans were well aware and inhabited of and inhabited the Mississippi for millennia. So at any rate, let's see here. Uh, 1599, Don Juan de Oñate, another character for whom you might arguably use to defend the black legend. Uh, a bit ruthless, tried to use psychological. Uh, there's a great book called um, When Jesus Came, the, uh, the Corn Mothers Went Away by a man named Gutierrez. Uh, but in it, he gives a lot of detail and Oñate playing mind games uh, playing power politics with the Navajo and the Pueblo natives of, of modern-day New Mexico. But he claims that in 1599, he's going to eventually be removed from power by the, uh, through the office of the, um, the Visitor General. So at any rate, um, then around 1769, right, through José de Galvez and these, quote, enlightened leaders of Spain under Carlos III, are going to decide that they're going to try to someter, they're going to try to submit and, 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 and gain power over uh, Native Americans. And also they're worried about the Russians by this time and the English um, in California. Uh, but they're wanting to do so uh, peacefully, right? Because you've already had the new laws. They had been a couple centuries back where they ended the encomienda. And you have different crowns like Philip II who tried to uh, bring about more of a peaceful colonization of the Americas because there had been a lot of discourse about how the Native Americans were treated, especially if you look up Las Casas versus Sepulveda. Back in Spain, they were having debates before the crown as far as how natives ought to be treated. So at any rate, that's going to begin the famous 21 Spanish missions up the California coast and the Camino Real, the royal path through which they did so. All right. So number one on your assignment, what you should have seen, and please remember, okay, I feel as if I'm acting when I write these argumentative pieces out. Uh, it is not uh, necessarily what I, what I subjectively think, okay? I think it's a, a thought-provoking thesis, so please keep that disclaimer in mind. But what I'm arguing on number one, right, is that it was the system. It wasn't the Spaniards in particular, but it was a system that was inviting this type of exploitation and brutality that the Spaniards brought, and not just the Spaniards, uh, to the Americas, right? So at any rate, you have the opening of the of the the race for the Indies, right? The Moluccas Islands, the the Spice Islands, uh, in Indonesia, uh, India, uh, uh, Japan. Uh, of course, the the writings going back from Marco Polo of the Great Khan and his empire through China and Mongolia, and these other stories of riches, right? Well, these as particularly the the young republics of Italy, their merchants are going to gain entrance into these places, and right at this time in the early modern period around the 1500s, etc., you're going to get the beginnings of these nation states, right, with kings these somewhat relatively more powerful kings and queens who are trying to consolidate their power and also try to enhance their prestige 
and sense of credibility. You have to remember that that crowns like Ferdinand and Isabella of Aragon and Castile, uh, they were claimed by enemies in their own country uh, to be usurpers, to be illegal thieves of their of their thrones. So at any rate, um, th this would help enhance their prestige, right? So what they often ended up doing is saying, okay, uh, merchants, form your own joint stock companies, uh, venture your own wealth and your own money, sacrifice your own lives if possible, and try to gain uh, a spice island, a trading post somewhere there in the Orient and uh, in the East, right, in Asia. And in doing so, uh, you have to give your royal one-fifth to the crown. So it seemed to have been a win-win situation for these new kings and queens of Western Europe. To, to invite this rat race into these foreign pagan, quote, non-Christian lands and allow them to take it. And so you say, again, I keep mentioning the, the Spice Islands, uh, that will go back and forth between Portuguese and Dutch uh, military merchants uh, as far as um, propriety, claiming their rights to own it, to have it. And it was basically, it was always, almost always backed by money or backed by uh, muscle, by military might. So it was an ugly game to play, uh, but the crowns in the, in the Western Europe uh, increasingly were willing to play it. So at any rate, with the Spaniards, right, they had the Reconquista, the reconquest of, of, of Muslim Spain. Now, by the 1490s, it was virtually all but gone, uh, which had started in 711 by Ibn al-Tariq. But by this time, right, the Spaniards still had had a long tradition of at least claiming a holy war against these Muslims uh, to get them out of Spain, right? And so at this time, uh, many people who took the opportunity to become conquerors, to become conquistadores and adelantados moving forward in the new world, it seems to demographically have come from the second sons of Hidalgos. And that makes a lot of sense to some historians because the Hidalgos were nouveau riche, these newly rich, uh, newly ennobled uh, men who fought against the Muslims back in Spain. And so they had seen their dads do this and enrich themselves and give their families a better taste of life, right, materially uh, through their military uh, success. And they had the uh, mayorazgo back in Spain, the hijo mayor, the oldest son, got everything. So a lot of these second sons, they got a taste of a better life through their father's military endeavors, through the example of their fathers fighting their way to wealth and a better life. And so they followed that in the Americas, by and large. And of course, there were always exceptions to that demographic, but many of that particular group seems to have taken on the call, okay? Then also, let's see here, moving on uh, to number two. Notice um, with this one, right, is I'm, I'm making the argument, which is very subjective, and you could totally disagree with this, but I'm making the argument that the Spanish didn't know any better, that at the time of the 1500s, their worldview was absolutely inundated with religion. And so when they were told by Pope Alexander VI that it was their that it was that their right to conquer the Americas was contingent upon their spiritual responsibility to make sure that the Native American souls were were one right to Christianity and to the Catholic Church. Uh, a lot of them took that seriously. Now, of course, did some abuse this system and use religion only as a, as a tool for domination? Of course, um, but at any rate, especially with the clergy, you find a lot of evidence. Of, of, of more complexity than that. Uh, for instance, in the Spanish-American uh, Cal California missions, right? Junipero Serra, not so long ago, was canonized as a saint by Pope Francis. And um, there are hagiographies, these biographies written to try to enhance his sainthood status. So you've got to keep that in mind when you read them. But they show lots of evidence of his, of his willingness to sacrifice himself, put himself in danger, uh, go through many um, uh, um, privations, right, and live a very austere lifestyle, uh, all in obedience to his faith and what he believed was God's will for him and his role uh, under God. Uh, to, to convert the souls of these Native Americans. But notice also, there's evidence that uh, from uh, a van named, man named Van Kotzebue, who was a priest who had come in, and he's a primary source 
uh, observer of one of the, the missions in California, and he said that it was a coercive institution and that he saw everywhere Native Americans in chains, chained up and constantly being punished uh, rather severely in his eyes. And also you had um, Vallejo, who was ordered to uh, catch runaways. They were not free to leave once they became converted and they were forced back upon the missions. And you have drama, right? Like Saint, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Saint, but Stanislaw, right? Uh, Stanislaus Rebellion from San Jose Mission, etc., to show this complexity. And you see here a, a more contemporary sign here, no sainthood for Sarah. So to, uh, to revisionist historians, court historians praise the Spaniards. They talk about the, the self-sacrifice and the other things that were, that were carried out by the Spaniards, right, in the name of progress and improving the plight of Native Americans here in California. And it didn't help also that with the exception possibly of the Chumash, the Native Americans in California primarily had not even achieved the, the agricultural revolution. So they were seen as, as primitive hunter-gatherers. But at any rate, right, uh, you have accusations of people like Narciso Duran that he was running a sweatshop in the San Jose mission. But he, they were teaching them many modern, uh, uh, economically applicable jobs and skills, right, for, the, for the, the, the growing beginnings of industrialization of the uh, European economy and Euro-American economy. So at any rate, uh, let's see here. And then also, um, if you do organic history, you don't worry about uh, either praising the Spaniards, like in court history, or revisionist history, wanting to revise the court, rosy pictures, and, and showing the Spaniards as um, exploiters and, and villainous, right? As you could just simply focus upon contributions. And so the Spanish, right, in addition to the obvious things, in, 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 like with uh, animals and plants, etc., right? Uh, sadly, pathogens that the, Euro that the Europeans brought to the Americas. You also have things such as Roman and Germanic law. So much of what we're familiar with as far as law and order, uh, as far as the court system, etc., is, is recognizable due to the Roman and Germanic influence, right? You look back at the Siete Partidas back in Spanish history, and they codified law combining Germanic from the Visigoths and Roman um, uh, her heritage, right, or laws. And so at any rate, the whole idea of, of just uh, city planning. Uh, by the way, I would highly recommend uh, J.H. Eliot, Empires of the Atlantic World, Britain and Spain and America. A very good book, very informative. Uh, comparison and contrast oftentimes between the two. But at any rate, he says that, that Spanish colonization was very urban oriented. And so a lot of pueblos, right, were established and the good and bad that come with city, right, uh, to this day uh, came with that. And so many of the modern cities were, were brought about on the West Coast from the Spanish. The arts and the sciences, uh, you had the, um, uh, the Romantic movement to come. You had the uh, Baroque movement, right? Uh, and the Spanish were involved here in Latin America. I mean, you look at uh, different writers uh, down in Mexico, uh, today's Mex modern Mexico, right? And um, to see that there were literary and artistic uh, ties between Spain and her colonies. And so the arts and sciences somewhat flourished from Mexico City, for instance. And then Hispanic culture, a lot of legends, a lot of things pertaining to the Catholic Church, right? Compadrasco, having a, um, a godfather or a godmother and everything that's entailed with that. Uh, the different rites that were to be followed, these customs to be unwritten laws to be followed when someone wanted to marry someone else. Some have lasted to this very day uh, from Spain. And then legends, right? La, La Llorona. Uh, Los Duendes, right? Uh, the um, uh, El Baile de los Viejitos, right? Uh, lots of things that have survived as Mexican folklore, etc., have survived through the Spanish as early as the 1590s into New Mexico. All right? 
So at any rate, let's move, let's move on. Uh, Spanish hierarchy. So notice on number three, right? Number three is in support somewhat of the black legend. It's stating that the Spanish created a rather inequitable, kind of economically unfair, uh, imbalanced, right, society. And it was very hierarchical, where it was very hard to move your way up the hierarchy. That it was, it was somewhat oligarchic, right? That a few people um, uh, had the best things in life oftentimes at the expense of the many. And so I defend that on number three, right? So the Spanish hierarchy, they formed somewhat. It seemed to have been uh, a, an adaptation to the reality of things. The Spaniards came primarily as um, unmarried men or married men who did not bring their wives, oftentimes initially. Uh, they're going to have Spanish legislation to, to prove that, where they're going to try to move wives over here to the Americas. And so with that uh, gender imbalance, a lot of men are going to have babies with indigenous women, with Native American women. And so much of modern day Mexico, Guatemala, and other Latin American countries demographically are going to consist of mestizos, uh, um, theoretically uh, half uh, European right uh, background and half Native American background. And so at any rate, the Peninsulares were the, those from the Iberian Peninsula. And it seems like only the Peninsulares could be the viceroy, a governor, uh, a visitor general, a member of the Aud Aud uh, Audiencia, sorry, their, uh, their, their Supreme Court system, right, of judges, etc. And then the Criollos, the Criollo Criollos are arguably going to run uh, hundreds of years from now uh, the wars for independence in Latin America, right? And they were oftentimes claiming European heritage on both sides, uh, but they were simply born here in the Americas. And that's for a whole other lecture and, and discussion. And so at any rate, uh, mercantilism was established pretty arguably well. Alan Brinkley in the textbook contends that, that it, he even goes so far as saying that it, uh, it stifled enterprise. That's arguable. Uh, but nevertheless, you have that, right? And then remember we talked about wiggle room and crumbs off the table. So you could join a local guild, no matter what your ethnic ancestry oftentimes was, right? They were called confradias. Uh, you oftentimes could rise up through the church or the military, just like back in Europe, right? And you could even get gracias al sacarnos. You could even earn through meritorial service, like you save a rich man's child from drowning, or something. You could earn a certificate of whiteness, I kid you not, whereby you were to treat, be treated legally as a Spaniard. And then also on the frontier, there seems to have been wiggle room. Uh, as early as 1781, it was noted in La Pueblo of Los Angeles, right, of Los Angeles, that there were, um, quote, we wouldn't call them that now, but mulattoes, right, um, um, African heritage, and, and white or Spanish heritage, right? Uh, and mestizos, etc., who not only comprised the uh, population of Los Angeles, but even served in its cabildo, its city council. And then, of course, another thing in defense of the Spanish, right, was the Juez de Residencia, right, uh, whereby a visitor general would come in unannounced, put a Spanish uh, official under house arrest, and give everybody in the area an opportunity to bring forth any accusations against that person. And sometimes under the Juez de Residencia, even a viceroy, right, could be removed from power if found guilty. All right. So at any rate, moving on to the last one is, let's see here, section number four is I point to the English and in particular, right, English Virginia by the 1700s. If you look there under a guy named David Hackett Fisher, his, his book called uh, New Albion, or I'm sorry, or Albion Seed. At any rate, in this book, he shows a picture of a very oligarchic establishment under the English. And also, right, arguably in, in the argumentative piece I write, is the English rather quickly went to great lengths to make manumission, formally gaining your freedom or purchasing your freedom as an African slave, much more difficult in the English colonies. Uh, there are books written that contend that the Spanish were more likely to let the market do its thing, especially in South America and places like Lima. Uh, you have a lot of urban uh, located slaves who were able to get side jobs, earn enough money to buy their manumission, 
and there that was it and they were freed so you can make arguments especially if I engaged in more time on this which I won't for the sake of brevity I don't want to talk your ear off uh, but you can make the argument that it was a lesser evil to be an African slave in Latin America than it was in English uh, North America in the southern colonies and so at any rate uh, I hope this has helped I hope you're doing well please let me know if you have any questions and you guys hang in there, okay? And I hope you learned something. Take care, okay? And I apologize if I made any errors. Bye-bye.